Next speaker is Kai Kornhuber, who will talk on concurrent heat waves and simultaneous breadbasket failures. Um, yeah, hi. It's great to be here. Um, I started not too long ago uh, at um, the Lamont uh, Earth Observatory with Radley Horton, um, looking at um, yeah, recurrent and simultaneous uh, heat waves that are triggered by specific uh, circulation patterns in the upper troposphere and then ultimately also investigating um, impacts on food security. Um, so thanks a lot for putting this together, Samantha. Uh, it's really nice to see all these people that are associated with the Earth Institute postdoctoral program for the first time, I guess, and I hope we can talk a bit after all this is over and get to know each other a bit better. Um, so just to start with a, a recent example, um, some of you might remember uh, past year's uh, heat waves. Um, there are so many record heat events now occurring that you, know, you might have forgotten about this, but it was actually a very severe event. Um, and this is the upper tropospheric circulation pattern um, provided by the uh, meridional winds, which are a pretty good um, proxy for like meandering of the jet stream. So it's an up and down flow, basically, so the north and southward winds. Um, and let me see if I can show this again. Uh, so you see these red and blue uh, dots kind of encircling the globe that is essentially like our high and low pressure systems um, going from west to east. And there's this moment where the signal really amplifies over Eurasia, and it's essentially a very persistent, um, strongly meandering um, jet regime uh, that then led to these uh, persistent heat waves over uh, large parts of the Northern Hemisphere. So that's a headline of the Washington Post um, from that time. And um, what we showed in that paper here is that uh, these uh, hotspots uh, like here in Western Europe and over the Caspian Sea and a few over uh, Siberia and the US were all linked by this um, almost hemispheric uh, circulation regime. And uh, another thing that we showed in that paper is that this was a essentially a recurrent pattern that uh, led to um, other very extreme events, specifically in, in Western Europe uh, before, in um, past summers. Um, just to highlight that these things are really uh, relevant in a way, just a few examples from uh, this year's summer, uh, where we saw again uh, yeah, a stationary wave pattern causing this extreme and record-breaking heat event in France. And we wrote this paper about uh, this event um, stating that this was the day where the European heat record of 2003 was broken and not knowingly that by the time that this paper got uh, basically published, uh, so this was a comment, so it was really a fast turnaround. There was just another heat wave developing, which again broke that same record. So um, it's a bit tough to see that you cannot publish fast enough to kind of cope with these extreme uh, heat events uh, happening. So this is just, uh, again, the meridional wind and the temperature normally during that time. Um, and there are a few other events last year where we saw like, very strongly meandering jet patterns as, as shown here now, the, the total wind speed uh, in late August. And again, then in September, uh, always associated with, with heat when you have like a, a ridge and, and mostly cold and, and rainfall when you have a trough developing. Um, <clears throat> so the interesting part about this is essentially uh, the fact that you know you, we usually see simultaneous events uh, occurring, and uh, I spent a lot of time in the past year trying to find out if there's some um, systemic uh, thing that we can find out about where these heat waves occur uh, mostly, and, and if we can um, find out about what what types of regimes are associated with that. And for doing so, um, I will take a step back and just quickly uh, introduce uh, Rossby waves. Um, it's essentially a way to quantify um, how and uh, how strongly waves uh, are occurring in, in the mid-latitudinal jet. Um, so this is an example of 
uh, kind of a wave seven pattern. You see these uh, seven troughs and ridges that encircle the globe here. This is, of course, highly idealized, but this is essentially the way uh, we, we quantify these uh, patterns. So we, we use um, like simple, uh, single, uh, simple uh, sine curves as, as a model for this. I look into the uh, upper wind field, uh, 300 millibars, and, and what we can um, then quantify is essentially the, the zonally elongated uh, um, Rossby wave pattern um, that that uh, yeah is, is linked with these meandering uh, jet uh, regimes, and um, we have uh, two important um, yeah uh, variables uh, in that respect, and this is the wave number. So again, this would be a wave seven pattern, and also the phase. And um, if we want to know about where these um, wave uh, regimes occur uh, around the globe, uh, the longitudes, we have to look at the phase position. Um, so if you look at those uh, synoptic scale uh, waves, those that are approximately the size of weather patterns, so a few thousand uh, kilometers uh, in width, uh, and then uh, quantify the position uh, of their phases, where they occur, essentially, we find that a few uh, waves show uh, a particular behavior in having like one single peak um, in the distribution when amplified. So this red curve shows us the distribution during high uh, amplitude wave events, while the black one shows you uh, the climatology or all remaining normal weeks. Uh, and those two waves are wave five and wave seven, while wave six uh, shows some type of um, yeah, bimodal behavior, um, if at all. So it's, it's, more, it's a more broad uh, distribution. And um, the outcome of this one single preferred phase is that we, when we do a composite of um, the wind fields and the temperature fields associated with these uh, high amplitude wave events, uh, we get very coherent patterns uh, around the globe. And, um, from top to bottom, this is the meridional wind again, uh, temperature anomalies and the precipitation anomalies. Um, stippling shows uh, significance here, and here significance is shown by hatching. Um, so this is quite interesting we should, uh, because we don't select for the phases. We just look at these high amplitude events, right? So there seems to be some type of regime character associated with those two waves. And that is specifically pronounced over the American Atlantic Euro sector here, where those two, two waves essentially show like uh, opposite signs and, and temperatures um, and um, also wind fields, right? So, uh, well, wave five is linked to cold and wet Western European uh, uh, weather. Wave seven is essentially very dry and very hot as seen in, in recent years. Um, so we take a closer look at this. Um, I did the same analysis for this pattern as well, but um, yeah, um, it's enough to just uh, walk through these results of wave seven. Um, so what is interesting now to find out if this composite pattern is indeed um, a signal of simultaneously occurring heat events or if this is just an artifact of doing a composite, right? It could just be single wave trains that then show up when doing a mean um, across all these events that, that we identified. And for this, we use uh, a very simple method that was introduced um, in these two papers um, for analyzing the relationship between uh, extreme events and um, violent outbreaks. Um, so a different uh, topic, but this methodology is useful um, yeah, independent of what you're looking at. And it's essentially just counting um, co-incident uh, events in, in an event time series. So you, you don't have a correlation, you have like single events um, and uh, you just count how often they occur uh, at the same time. And by shuffling you can do like uh, a simple significance analysis essentially. 
Um, so we focused on those uh, areas that were yeah, um, uh, associated with, with am uh, amplified temperatures uh, over land only, and those were the three regions that we identified, one in Central uh, North America, one in Western Europe, and one uh, over the Caspian Sea region. Um, and we uh, specified heat events by looking into weekly averages, uh, the near, to, near uh, surface temperature uh, in units of standard deviation, um, and the spatial coverage that those uh, temperature anomalies uh, within that region um, basically yeah, exhibit. Um, and for the wave events, we just looked at the high amplitude wave events, so those uh, events, so those weeks where uh, the amplitude uh, exceeded a specific threshold, which is more or less arbitrary. You would get the same results if you vary it a bit, but we needed to take a specific fixed thre threshold that would uh, provide us with sufficient events, and that in our case uh, was 1.5 standard deviation, and we got 40 events roughly out of these um, um, yeah, reanalysis data sets that we looked at. Um, so this is the analysis essentially, and in this heat map um, I have the spatial coverage on the x-axis and the temperature anomaly on the y, uh, so vice versa, this is the y-axis of course, that's the x-axis, axis. and the, essentially the further up you are in the upper right corner, the more severe a heat extreme is. So below here you would have uh, a relative coverage of 0.2% of that area and um, uh, yeah, showing a, a temperature anomaly of uh, above uh, the mean, so that is fairly common. Um, and the further up you go, you know, the more extreme temperature anomalies and, and the special coverage um, become up to a, a value of the whole area showing temperature anomaly of um, above 3.5, which what you can see here never happens. Um, and so this is the coincidence of um, two heat extremes of that specific severity uh, coinciding um, under the condition that a wave event is present, right? And uh, you can see here basically the further red it is, the more often it does happen. Um, so one of one means that all these events uh, basically coincide with a wave event. Um, we can do this uh, also with non-wave events and we see that this doesn't happen that often. So these events that occur then are more or less all in the lower left corner. So the takeaway is simultaneous events across those two regions um, are really more uh, likely when a wave event is uh, happening. And yeah, we can do this across all regions uh, and the results are essentially uh, similar um, qualitatively. Um, so the ultimate motivation of this research is of course how do um, uh, bread baskets react to this um, and we all know that extreme events are bad for, uh, for crop production, but the uh, question was, um, are these wave events so closely linked to extreme weather that we can essentially look at these wave events uh, and get a signal in crop production? And um, this we did, uh, looking at those regions that we identified uh, uh, before using uh, the FAO annual data sets and um, then doing like simple uh, distributions of how the crop yields or the crop production um, react depending on one event per year or more than one event per year. And um, with a few exceptions like Europe, interestingly, um, we see this coherent image of you know, the more events you have in a year, the, the worse it is. Um, and this also across all regions. So um, the uh, research question 
that, that we wanted to uh, answer is essentially do these wave events pose a risk for simultaneous uh, crop uh, failures across the northern hemisphere and at least for those regions we could show that. Um, and future research will try to generalize this a bit more, not focusing on those two regimes alone, but in general looking into like more meridional um, flow patterns and also in, uh, fu in, in future projections. Um, so uh, this is just a short outlook. Uh, of course, this is one of the questions um, that, is, that are currently discussed a lot in, in climate uh, uh, science, especially in the dynamics uh, community, do we see more of those strongly meandering jet patterns? Um, how can we explain it? Uh, is Arctic amplification associated with this? What are the mechanisms? And um, just based on reanalysis data set, the image is not that clear. So we see an increasing trend of these events. But um, the, the problem is that if we have a very high threshold for the amplitude, uh, then we have very few events and, um, you know, there are upward trends, but I wouldn't trust them too much. Um, if we then filter for the phase, uh, we see stronger trends, some of them significant, but still um, I would be a bit cautious about um, future projections. Um, and uh, this is essentially what I'm looking at. Uh, at the moment, um, the first question uh, that needs to be answered, of course, is do these models uh, accurately represent those uh, flow patterns? And, and there are some doubts about that. Um, so this is just a you know, very uh, preliminary result showing um, the uh, wave amplitudes in JJA, uh, basically a climatology across uh, a bunch of CMIP5 models and, uh, and this is the same essentially but comparing it to uh, NSAP NCAR reanalysis which I show here. So this is um, blue basically means they underrepresent these uh, wave numbers, red means they, they show two high amplitudes um, and there seems to be kind of a systemic uh, yeah, a, a picture arising that, that these um, wave numbers above four are sometimes at least underrepresented. Um, and yeah, the task is now kind of to, to see why that is and um, maybe we will be able to do some type of process-based uh, model evaluation here to see what, what types of drivers m are not well represented across those models to um, yeah, maybe make those future predictions or future projections of extreme weather a bit more reliable. Um, looking at the phase positions, uh, so basically um, the plot that I showed very early on, um, it doesn't look that bad, so that gives me a bit of hope that the models are actually not doing that bad uh, in terms of where these extremes occur, but maybe they are sometimes underestimating their frequency or their severity. Um, so again, just highlighting this upper, um, upper part of the spectrum, which is relevant for these synoptic scale weather patterns. Um, so just to summarize a few key points, we have these two recurrent wave patterns. So this shows the wave seven pattern again in a nicer um, type of uh, uh, yeah, global uh, plot. Um, they do uh, favor simultaneous heat extremes across all of those regions uh, with effects on uh, pro crop production. Um, there seems to be a recent increase in frequency. If this is a long-term trend, it's kind of an open question. Um, models seem to underestimate them, but this is uh, yeah, a matter of uh, current research. So the outlook is, um, learning more about the triggers and the precursors um, and finding out if those regimes are useful for um, improving predictions of heat waves, uh, specifically in Europe as, as they seem to be very much linked to heat waves uh, over Western Europe. Um, and the project that is essentially on my desk right now is to extend that analysis 
into future um, crop production um, projections using models uh, and trying to figure out what's going to happen. Um, if you're interested in this type of research, we host a session at the HU um, in December. So if you want to drop by, that would be highly appreciated. We have a lot of nice talks. And um, yeah, hope that was interesting in some way. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we have time for questions. Uh, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, interesting talk, thanks. So, <clears throat> in the models, typically the jet is too low, right? So, I'm, I'm wondering if there's any relationship with what you're showing in terms of the biases of the models. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there's some relationship with that because the, so where these you know, waves position themselves is very much linked to what type of forcing from, you know, the surface they experience, like, you know, the Rockies and the Himalayas uh, are probably the most important forcing patterns there to, you know, determine where these waves position themselves. So if the jet is too low and they see, they, they, they don't see that type of uh, barrier in their way, then that is probably an issue. And um, if I may just relate it to that, so I really liked your point about the Arctic amplification. So mm. I'm wondering if you could then, I mean, if we think about land, for instance, where the temperature gradient may be higher, uh, zonal, so could that be linked to that? Maybe that you know, you're missing some of that higher frequency and therefore maybe that gradient would actually amplify. So maybe the models that would be de deficient there might also have very different Arctic response somehow. Um, do you mean zonal or meridional gradient? Uh, meridional, sorry, sorry. Because meridional, I sorry. think zonal gradients are really relevant too. Um, like the, the, str the strongest signal in summer is actually the land warming. It's mm -hmm. not that much uh, Arctic amplification. That's rather a winter signal. So in summer, the strongest trends that affect the circulation, the mid-latitudes, I think, are land warming. So these strong mm -hmm. temperature gradients occurring between oceans and, and land. I think are those that are probably driving the persistence of some of these regimes, but that is still to be shown. Okay, <laughs> so I'm looking you. into that, yeah. Very interesting. Okay, all right, thank, thank you. you.